I'm the executive director of an organization called the Software Freedom Conservancy, um, which is a technology nonprofit dedicated to free and open source software. Um, I'm a lawyer, which sometimes there's really nothing to hide behind on this stage if you throw rotten fruit at me. <laughs> but uh, but uh, these days, I only do legal advice for charities um, and part of my nonprofit work. Um, my background is that I did a lot of uh, programming uh, once upon a time in C, Fortran, Lisp. Uh, I have a technical background. I am extremely geeky. <laughs> um, I am also a patient, like so many people here. I have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which just means that I have a really big heart. Um, and uh, I, uh, having that heart condition changed me from being someone who thought that open source was cool and useful and even necessary for business to being someone who thought that free and open source software was essential for our society. And I'm going to tell you about that journey a little bit. Um, so. Having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy means that I'm a very at a very high risk of suddenly dying. Um, it's at a two to three percent chance per year compounding. And uh, like so many people, like so many patients, I was sitting in my doctor's office, uh, my electrophysiologist, and uh, he explained to me that this was all going to be okay because I can get a defibrillator, and uh, won't it be nice? And then he has a pile of defibrillators in his desk. That, and pacemakers, and basically so that he can slide them across the desk to the patients that he's prescribing them to, and they can hold them, and they can see this isn't so scary, right? This is a small, lightweight thing. It's, you know, I can imagine having this you know, under my skin. It's not such a big deal. And so he gives it to me, and I look at it, and I say, what does it run? And he says, run? And I say, well, yeah, you know, this device has software on it, you know. <laughs> um, would you, can you tell me a little bit about the software? And he said, software? He had never thought about the software on these devices before. Never. And he said, but don't worry, because today you're in luck. Tom is here, the medical rep, like the, the rep from the medical device company. Tom knows everything about these devices. I'll just get Tom right in here, and Tom will tell you everything you need to know. So Tom comes in, and I say, what does it run? Tom says, run. <laughs> he then follows with software, right? And, so, and he, Tom had never been asked about the software before, not by the hundreds of electrophysiologists that he services. My electrophysiologist alone implanted thousands, right? Thousands of these, often multiple devices per day, and he hadn't thought about it. Now, me, with a programming technical background, I know that these devices, I know that all software is vulnerable. It's just when you start to, when you code, you understand that it's very difficult to get all of the bugs out of, so you, you can't anticipate every situation and you know that there are going to be problems. And so once you know that, you can't see equipment the same way again, right? Like Ben's holding up his insulin pump and saying this is a computer. It's, you, you can never see things in that way, you know, it, without looking at it that way again. So I had to get the device, which made me a really terrifying thing. I'm a cyborg lawyer, really terrifying. Um, but, uh, but I used it as, an, as, a, as a way to do research um, on these devices and their efficacy and safety, bringing my software background together with my legal one. And what I found will not surprise anyone who has any software background at all, which is that software has bugs. Like, it, software has bugs. The Software Engineering Institute estimates that for every 100 lines of code, one bug is introduced. That is a lot of bugs. In a study that, that took a look at software, at recalls of medical devices based on software, 98% of them could have been detected with all pairs testing, testing for multiple conditions, basic computer science stuff. Um, so not terribly shocking to me, but shocking when you think about it in the context of how many devices we have and how many we, you know, how we interact with them. And so I said to my electrophysiologist, who constantly, by the way, as I cycled through electrophysiologists who were suspicious of me as a lawyer, you really can't win as a lawyer as a, or as a, a hacker type. <laughs> get suspicion from both ends. <laughs> um, but, uh, but the answer was always, well, the FDA reviews these, you know, reviews these devices. They wouldn't approve them if they weren't safe or if they had problems. And of course, we know that that's simply not you know, that the, these devices do in fact have problems, and the FDA, in fact, doesn't review the, so the source code typically of any of these devices. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that they do it, because to do so would 
require a tremendous amount of resources that I think the FDA doesn't have. However, they're not reviewing the software. And even worse for me, as someone with a technical background, the fact that the FDA is not reviewing the software also means that they're not requesting copies of the source code generally. So there's no public repository of the software, which means if there's catastrophic failure at one of these medical device companies, you know, I, will we be able to, to fix bugs or address problems down the road in these devices? It's, uh, it's, it's quite troubling. And since I started doing this research and started talking about it, there have been a number of exploits, uh, mostly by academics and, um, and by other people who are interested. They call that white hat. Um, and so uh, there have been a lot of, uh, of, of examples showing you how vulnerable these devices are. This is a picture from one of those studies where they implanted uh, one of these devices in a bag of meat so that <laughs> they could try to, uh, to, uh, to sh and then the, the, uh, the fact that these, uh, these hacks were so visible actually caused Dick Cheney to request that the wireless component be disabled from uh, his hardware and his heart device. So sort of as we start talking about these issues and raise problems with these, security issues are real and they are troubling. Um, this is one of my favorite hacks. It's a very short walk from medical devices, which we all are, you know, literally uh, sewn and connected to my heart, screwed into my heart, to cars, which we rely on every day. And to give you context for that one in 100 lines of code, um, this is a picture from a car, um, a car hack study, and you'll see that the uh, that the car thinks it's going 140 miles per hour, but it also thinks it's in park. And a premium class car has close to 100 million lines of code in it, which means that at that 1 in 100, there are about a million defects. Even if you catch the vast majority of these defects, there are still going to be vulnerabilities. And I sit here in the audience, and I hear all of these exciting and impressive innovations. I, I almost weep with hope thinking about the challenges that my family has had um, with their conditions and the possibilities that we have when our devices are networked and we can get better care and we have new technology and we can't even anticipate what it, we're going to have next. But when our phones are talking to our medical devices, which are hooked up to a network, we don't even know what our, our weakest link is, right? So the car hackers, they didn't go through like directly to the ignition system or the brake system, they went through the wheel maintenance system. They go through the entertainment system. It's not the things that look like they're the critical systems that are necessarily going to be the vulnerable, point, vulnerable points. And while everything is connected to everything else, we don't even know which, is our, which software is the critical software. So free and open source software has a lot of obvious benefits to it. Um, and to me, uh, and, uh, and to security researchers generally, it's, uh, it's clear that free and open source software is better and safer over time. I can't stand up here and tell you that just because something is free and open source software, it will be better or safer. Um, but methodology-wise and over time, free and open source software is the only way to have um, ethical and safe software over time. With free and open source software, if there's a problem, you don't have to wait for the company who manufactured your device to first admit there is a problem and then go make a fix and release that fix. With free and open source software, anyone can make a fix to that. And that's really, really important, especially when you're worried about things that other people might not be worried about when you have a special case. So when I was, uh, recently, I was recently pregnant, and while pregnant, I was shocked twice by my defibrillator unnecessarily. And rather than reprogram my defibrillator to address this issue, instead, I took medication to slow my heart rate down. Could barely walk up a flight of stairs for the duration of my pregnancy. But that was the solution, because there's no real appreciable ability to alter my device. So these are sort of things that you know, the medical device manufacturer, I promise you, does not want pregnant women getting shocked and would work hard to make sure that that wasn't the case. But I'm just simply not a, a large set of people, and so uh, we don't even know which, what situations we're going to have, and this goes back to that sort of all Paris testing. It's hard to anticipate every situation that every patient will experience. Um, with, uh, with free and open source software, 
we remove our reliance on any single company and we take back our healthcare uh, for ourselves and we can hire uh, whoever we want to, to help. It's, it expands beyond that monopoly. Uh, there's this thing called the honeymoon effect, which I wish were drinks on the beach. But <laughs> in fact, it's a, it was a security study that showed, uh, it looked at uh, vulnerabilities in software over time. And uh, it looked at free and open systems, and it looked at proprietary systems. And it showed there are various benefits to free and open systems that I won't get into. Um, but one of the things that was the most striking about this is that it showed that, counterintuitively, we think that vulnerabilities happen um, right when a device is, is released. We think about security at the beginning, and once something is in the, you know, in use, we think that it's a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit safer. It's been tested, it's been used, but in fact, that's uh, not how it works. That for the beginning of the release, there's uh, there's zero vulnerabilities, and then for some unknown period of time, and then once that uh, once the time elapses, once time goes, we get to one vulnerability, it increases almost exponentially. Um, and what this tells me is that it's not today that we have to be worried about our security when we've got great relationships with our medical device companies, great relationships with our vendors. It's down the road, and I want my device to last the 10 to 12 years that is the outside band on when my device is going to last. And you know, I, I, I don't know what vulnerabilities are going to be in there, and if we don't have access to the source code of these devices, that device becomes useless. And so I want to know what is in my own body. I want to see the source code that is in my own body. These devices have been shown to be vulnerable. They've shown to be capable of providing uh, fatal shocks and lethal doses in the case of insulin pumps. We know that security through obscurity simply doesn't work. We are only going to be safer over time with free and open source software. So security through obscurity simply does not work, and to ignore security is negligence. Thank you.